Good morning to you all. At BDO Wealth Advisors, we love engaging with our clients, uh, whether it's at presentations or um, meetings or gatherings, we just love interacting with, uh, with clients. That hasn't been possible since the onset of the pandemic 18 months ago. And I must say, I don't think um, I would have imagined myself still addressing an almost largely virtual audience 18 months into uh, the, the pandemic. But um, here we are today, um, and it's um, lovely to have you all with us. At um, BDO Wealth Advisors, we, our core mission is to assist our clients to make the right decisions so that we can make a positive contribution to all aspects of your lives. The past year has been particularly challenging. I think a lot of us have been more inward looking and um, reassessing where we want to be in, in life, uh, where we want to go, what our ambitions are. So I think it was um, with that in, in mind that we thought, let's have this presentation. Let's forget about uh, financial planning just for, for an hour. And let's look at um, uh, someone who is lead, leading a life uh, with, with meaning, something that a lot of us are, are looking for um, at the moment. But I'm going to, to hand over to my, my co-director and the CEO of BDO Wealth Advisors, Ricardo Tashira, to do the introductions and to tell you a bit more about that. Um, I'm really delighted to have you all with us this morning. And on a personal note, I'd just like to thank you all for including BDO as the, your partner in the journey that you take and for including us in the financial decisions that you take. Over to you, Ricardo. Thank you, Alan. So, why do you want to go to Mars? I know that's the question that's top of mind for most of you today, right? So, let me ask you a question in return. Um, why did Columbus uh, travel west? Why did Marco Polo head east? Well, I guess that's, it's all about the pull, the pull, the, the allure of the unknown. It's that uh, human spirit, that excitement as human beings that we want to adventure into something new and uh, explore new frontiers. So welcome to a conversation on exploration-driven innovation. I'm Ricardo Teixeira, and I'm delighted to moderate the discussion with you today. Thank you for joining the conversation. So when you registered for today's talk, you answered three questions um, about, um, uh, that we asked you to uh, give us your views on. I'd like to take a moment just to reflect on who we have in our audience and what you think about living off-planet. So the first question that we asked, which you responded to, was how would off-world exploration benefit life on Earth? So as you can see from the pie chart on your screens, is that there was a large proportion of you and us showing a very positive attitude and a positive view towards exploring new planets. I think, I suppose, with the view that it can indeed help us uh, I suppose, live better lives here on planet Earth. Uh, but there was also a very good representation of uh, views that we are actually really damaged planet Earth, so why go do the same on other planets? Moving forward to the next question, um, how long before man can afford a ticket to space? Now here, there was a very clear divide in your responses. Uh, there's a third, a third, and a third. One third see that uh, affordable space travel will never happen in their lifetime, so they're not going anywhere. There's another third who believe that actually it could happen, so we'll just kick that decision down the road another decade and we'll make it call when we get there. And then there's the other third, which I like to call the hopeful travelers, who are actually, actually possibly, maybe already saving for their Virgin Galactic or their Blue Origin tickets. So as your financial planner, we know who you are, and we are doing our best to make sure that your investment returns will deliver so that you can afford these tickets to space. And then the third and final question we asked was, would you ever relocate to Mars? And this was fascinating. I think, uh, surprisingly, a large proportion of our audience today are actually open to the idea of relocating to Mars. Yes, that's right. Only 40%, okay, 38% said, I ain't going, not a chance. But if you just focus on the remaining 62%, 
What fascinates me is that white slither on the pie chart of 7%. Yes, that's right. 7% of you are already planning your trip to Mars. Like, what? Really? Are these like retirement plans? <laughs> or like post-pandemic uh, in stress-induced decisions? I can tell you, as your financial planner, we do not know who you are. And I would encourage you to reach out to us quite quickly so we can make a plan as to how you're going to do this. So thank you for answering those questions. Um, and it's great to have your participation. Um, and what we have done today is we've set aside a, some time for Q&A where we will be able to really interact and have interactive conversation with our guest speaker on the topic. So as we go through the talk today, please, any topic that uh, comes top of mind or prompts you or piques your interest, just drop it into the chat box and we will facilitate those discussion and conversation at the end of the talk. Uh, we have also included a couple of live polls in our talk during the course of today. And so what you'll see on your screen will be a, 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 a Mentimeter that will come up and it will just prompt you to uh, take some, uh, make a selection. And if you can just make a selection on screen and submit it, we will then gather those results and take the live poll and share those results with you at the end of our discussion. But just to test that it's working, I'd like all of you now to on screen, um, have a look at the live poll and answer the question. So how much research on Mars did you do prior to attending today's event? None to minimal, quite a bit, but I won't admit it. I Googled like there was no tomorrow. So if you can bring up the, the results, we'll see this one live, but the rest will do uh, delayed at the end of the talk. And I know that when uh, I was, if I can share with you a sort of a stat, is that um, Mars has the same day cycle as Earth. That's 24 hours and 39 minutes. So you know clearly I'm sitting, I'm the only one that Googled like there was no tomorrow on that poll. Eh? And a lot of you have done no research. So you are here today to actually learn a bit about Mars. So with that, let me introduce our guest speaker. From winning first prize to the, uh, uh, sorry, at a local science fair um, for, uh, with a school project that she was titled Mar uh, Martian City at the age of 13, right through to um, being selected as one of the 100 international astronauts um, to visit um, and work with Mars One Project. She is a researcher at heart. She has a passion for a wide range of topics that span from quantum physics right through to the philosophy of science, um, including the origins of the building blocks of life in space, right through to team dynamics in extreme situations. She is determined to live off planet. She has also founded a, a foundation called Proudly Human, which strives to balance this desire and mission to live off planet with um, uplifting communities who are already living in very extreme environments here on planet Earth. She's an engaging and inspiring South African who's truly living her life with purpose and meaning. Please welcome the aspiring extraterrestrial theoretical physicist and technologist, Dr. Adriana Murray. Thank you so much to Alan. Thank you, Ricardo. And thank you especially to the live audience, which is a real privilege nowadays. So thanks for being here and warm greetings to everyone online. Um, I'm personally very curious to see how that 7% fluctuates during the talk or after, which we'll re-poll. So let's see if there are any converts, or hopefully that number doesn't drop um, after I explain a bit more about my decision. Those are the 7% who are already planning, uh, remember? So yeah, um, great. So if you have not done any research, because um, I'm going to give you some context to the idea that I believe in our lifetimes we will see the first trips from Earth to Mars with humans on board. Uh, so, so let's begin. Um, I'm a quantum physicist, and some of the things I'm going to tell you today need a bit of background. Um, so this is also a poll, actually. We're going to have a, a quiz, and we're going to display your results. So equation 1.26 is quite important for most of the talk. I'm joking. Um, we're not going to do the, the molecular biodynamics of the coronavirus molecule, not today anyway. We can do a follow-up session on that if anyone's interested. Um, we are here in the midst of a pandemic, and so we should be, I think, grateful, as always, that we can connect online and grateful that events 
like this with the in-person audience are, are also possible. Uh, and also grateful, as uh, Alan has pointed out, um, that we've had a time to reflect, I think. And for me, this has really solidified my belief even more deeply that becoming a multi-planetary species, to borrow Elon Musk's phrase, um, is really an absolute mandatory step for humanity if we are to advance to the next level. So let me, let me share a bit of background on, on that thinking. So what was I doing during the pandemic? Um, you may have seen that video of me in Antarctica. That was December 2019. So one of the last big trips that I had the opportunity to do. 2020 hit. This started off as a project, uh, a fun project, but when it became obvious that lockdown was imminent, um, my partner and I decided we didn't want to be locked down anywhere in the city, and we would actually follow through with building this habitat uh, in the Titsikama forest and actually live in that for, for most of 2020. So this is how you access the location. Um, in that way, it's quite extreme because it's a 1.8 kilometer hike down a hill, quite a steep one. This is all one shot, by the way. Uh, I had a GoPro on my head. We haven't edited it, it to make it look longer. <laughs> this is it. So we wanted it to be inaccessible. We wanted it to be remote. Um, so we carried almost uh, two tons of equipment down this hill to build our cabin, plus probably another ton of uh, a gas stove, a queen-size bed. Um, that was quite challenging. Um, but here we are setting up camp from scratch. And I must say one of the most important lessons I learned through this experiment, and I'll talk about the parallels with this experiment and subsequent ones that we're planning, including in Antarctica, um, in terms of resource management. Um, but the most important lesson I think I learned from this was humility. I mean, this was an exercise that we did almost for fun. We didn't want to be locked down in the city, but it was a harsh reminder that this is indeed, these are the conditions, in fact, even worse, that many South Africans and people around the world live, i.e. carrying water in buckets from the river, i.e. managing uh, a composting toilet, i.e. having to deal with waste by carrying it far away to dispose of it, um, having a constant challenge for communication. We had one bar at the cabin, two bars on the hill, so there were funny moments with groups in Singapore or in New York uh, where my laptop was balanced on a, a, like a rock and my phone was in the, in the tree to get better signal um, and trying to do video calls like that, but um, it wasn't a fake background in my case. Yeah, so we finally put the house together and of course hardware stores in South Africa closed down once the lockdown kicked in. So if we had a single connector to the inverter that was missing or a single you know, water pipe for the shower that was missing, we would have had to deal with that for the rest of the lockdown. So it was a bit of a tense moment uh, building up to the lockdown, but what a beautiful, peaceful place that we shared uh, with no other humans, thankfully, during that time. It would have been a bit surprising to see someone coming into such a remote location, uh, but plenty of animals. So um, the, the genet would visit at night, various genets, so many birds, snakes, etc. really a beautiful part. We were really grateful to have the, the fresh water, clean, mostly clean river flowing through. Um, this was the biggest challenge, getting that, getting that bed down there. I think the bed will die down there now. Um, yeah, it was a humbling experience to get closer to nature, but from the off-world project perspective, which I'm going to get to, this was a chance to reflect on resource consumption, and I'm going to return to this theme again and again, because I believe all of the challenges that we face currently here on Earth boil down to poor resource management. Um, our population continues to grow, we continue to be limited to a single planet, and nature, the biosphere, the natural system is buckling under the strain of our increasing, increasingly increasing resource consumption. We even refer to people as consumers. Our, our economic model is based on continuous growth. You know, something's got to give, and it is. The pandemic is predicted by global warming, right? When temperatures start to shift because of our industry and our impact on natural environments, naturally, the probability for epidemics to emerge increases. So we are now sitting in a predictable outcome of our impact on the natural environment. Predictable. Uh, nonetheless, uh, very uh, anxiety-ridden and stressful, but this was part of the prediction. So we, we've got to brace ourselves. Um, in 2019, I, I founded the organization Proudly Human on the assumption that things are not going to get less extreme here on Earth. I see zero evidence that things are going to get less extreme here on Earth. So the idea behind Proudly Human was to look at preparing for extreme conditions, whether on Earth or beyond. 
It doesn't have to be doom and gloom. It's also exciting to prepare for extreme conditions. It means we need to up our game. We need to advance our technologies and advance our way of thinking. And spending this uh, almost eight months down there in the valley was really a great way to reflect on personal resource utilization. So here's a question, and um, you can have a look at those. How much water do you use per day? So unless uh, some people are still stuck in the water restrictions in Cape Town of less than 50 liters, that's, that's quite extreme. But maybe some people have taken their cue from the restrictions and continued to live in that way. Recall that a few years ago, Cape Townians were mandated to, to use 50 liters or less per person per day. But I wonder how many of us have a, an accurate knowledge of how much water we use per day. So down in the forest, of course, I, I knew exactly how long you know, a 15 liter bucket of water would last in our gravity shower that we had set up. Um, we used to heat our water on the fire, so hot showers, yes, and uh, quite a reasonable one for 15 minutes if you've got low pressure. Um, but uh, I wonder what your answer to this question is. Um, because of course, when going into extreme environments, uh, how much water each person requires is a massive part of the logistics and planning for any kind of off-grid experiment, whether we're thinking about the moon, Mars, the winter in Antarctica, or just a, a day trip out to the desert or the Karoo, right? Water is a big part of uh, our bodies, and we need to consume a lot of it to stay alive. It's also heavy, so this is quite a, a central issue when thinking about resources um, for, for humans, you know, whatever the context. Um, so we'll, we'll refer back to the poll results um, at the end, so I hope you made your selection there. Uh, so what's the idea with Proudly Human and the, and the Off-World Project? Um, that uh, experiment in the forest was almost part zero. Um, that was what we did uh, during the pandemic, but uh, the plan was to go full steam ahead with this series of experiments, basically to collect data, to turn data into knowledge, whether it's on the technology side, the resource consumption side, but also on the team itself. So we plan to take carefully selected groups of experts um, and perform experiments in each of these locations in the upcoming years. So the footage you saw of myself in Antarctica was a location scout. I've been to deserts in the Middle East, deserts across Africa, and settled on a, a place which I'll, I'll refer back to in a moment for, for the desert environment. But here, as you can imagine, water management is the most critical part of the resource management for the team there. Um, so that was, would be what we collect data on to try to optimize technology. So like a single water molecule is not lost. Wherever there's evapora evaporation, we enclose that area. Um, I'll get to the exact infrastructure for that in a moment. Under the ocean might be a, an interesting one for some people. So this is uh, quite close to the idea of being you know, in the space station or on a base on the surface of the moon or Mars, because to go outside, you'll need to suit up. So pass through an airlock where you put on your scuba gear um, and then go outside of the habitat to do a recreational dive or go spearfishing or whatever it may be. Um, but the idea with the ocean mission is to, to spend some months living in an underwater habitat. Doesn't need to be super deep, but the idea of being in this differential pressure atmosphere environment to the one that's outside is important there for human psychology, but also multiple technology challenges. The Antarctic winter, so I'm sure you could see in the footage that that was indeed summer. Um, and uh, the most important thing if you go to Antarctica in the summer is actually your sunglasses because it is bright. There's like one color, the sky, the surface, white and very bright. So uh, I ended up uh, buying a lot of extra jackets that I didn't need, sunglasses, take note. <laughs> so the winter very different, of course. Um, Antarctica can only be accessed for a short period of the year between like November and February. Uh, for the rest of the year, there are some teams, sort of up to a thousand people that do spend the winter on the continent of Antarctica. These are researchers, right? Staying in the South Africa has a, a all year round base. Many other countries have their all round bases also. So that would be our challenge come the, the actual experiment where we spend the winter in Antarctica. So that's a bit more than a year. Um, and Antarctica, in my mind, is actually a closer approximation to being on the surface of Mars than the space station because the space station can be evacuated in an emergency in sort of 24 hours. Even the moon could be evacuated in an emergency in a matter of 72 hours. Uh, however, the Antarctic winter, you cannot leave. It's dark, it's stormy, no 
captain of any boat, no pilot of any plane or helicopter can be expected to risk their life and that of the co-pilot to enter the continent. So it's basically on a real lockdown, a physical lockdown, <laughs> physically it's not possible to leave for the duration of the winter. So in terms of the psychology and in terms of the real reliance on the infrastructure that you bring with you and set up, um, Antarctica is a great comparison. And I think uh, looking at the so-called heroic era of Antarctic exploration, which happened more than 100 years ago, late 1800s, early 1900s, those uh, all men in those days who set uh, sail to the horizon, that most southerly continent that wasn't mapped at that point. Nobody was even clear if it was ice or an island or if there's land underneath. Is it a series of islands or one continent? They had never, humans had never experienced the Antarctic winter before. So it's that spirit of exploration, I think, that we're seeing a revival on in terms of visiting the surface of next door neighbor planet Mars. So the data that we collect, and we'll be collecting all sorts of data from heart rate to facial expression recognition to uh, analysis of all, all parts of the water cycle um, to how much people are consuming, what's coming out, how we're we managing that, turning it back into water, etc. That kind of data we'll collect, as well as on the performance of all the technologies that we bring with us to iterate, optimize, and really collect a data set to prepare for the crew journeys back to the moon in the next perhaps five years. NASA has delayed from 2024, but um, in the next couple of years after 2024, we expect the Artemis program to deliver again after 50 years, um, people back to the surface of the moon. But more excitingly, in my opinion, is the plans of SpaceX to take crew to Mars in the next 10 years. So some, some updates on Mars. Um, during 2020, many industries were brought to their knees. Uh, the space industry was not one of them, right? The UAE, China, and the US all sent missions off to Mars. So if there were intelligent aliens watching, they probably gave a thumbs up because there was like traffic from Earth to Mars in 2020, even in the midst of the pandemic. All three of these missions arrived successfully. Huge congratulations to China in their first attempt delivering technology to the surface of Mars, they became the first country to succeed in the first attempt to do that. Hugely ambitious project. They had an orbiter and a lander and a rover all successfully deployed. Brilliant footage coming back from the Tianwen-1 rover. Um, and the UAE mission. So the UAE launched their first satellite 10 years ago. Now they have launched successfully an orbital mission to Mars. It's in orbit currently. Um, so huge congratulations to them too. It's great to see different parts of the world entering into the space industry. Um, and the US, a relative veteran in landing things on Mars. Uh, this was their ninth successful landing, I think. The Perseverance rover landed there. And I think a special um, uh, memory of Dr. Yapi Fansail who is a Namibian-born space engineer who was head of the JPL Space Exploration Program for many years. He tragically passed away just one month after the launch of the Perseverance rover um, of a heart attack in the US. Um, so very sadly, but we are, we are dedicating our Namibian project to his memory. He left a massive legacy for young people in Southern Africa, but also beyond. Um, and excitingly, he was part of the Ingenuity helicopter program. So probably you're aware that the first powered space flight off of Earth happened after the Perseverance rover landed, essentially a drone. 1.8 kilometer Ingenuity helicopter flew in the very thin atmosphere of Mars. So this was really a huge achievement for engineering um, and uh, in special memory of Dr. Yapi Fansel, who was pivotal in that. So the moon, we're also seeing things uh, heat up. Um, NASA is now involved in a court case with Blue Origin contesting SpaceX's award of the, pro of the contract to build the lander for the crew to the moon. And sadly, that's actually now meant a delay by at least one year for the program. Um, but that is what it is. You can do your reading on the details of that. Um, but excitingly, uh, a whole bunch of technologies by private companies are, are going to be launched. And I won't have time to go into detail today, but I'm part of the Foundation for Space Development Africa and Africa to Moon. Africa's first mission to the moon um, uh, is in our plans for the next two years, partnering with private companies who would deliver our technology, not our people, um, to the surface of the moon. Uh, so that was some brief kind of updates on, on space activity. Um, I should say before continuing that uh, maybe you saw last night, the first all-civilian crew, as we speak, is now in orbit around Earth. 
So an, another billionaire, so right, uh, men who are billionaires have already been able to afford trips to space. We've seen a few of them late, lately uh, with Richard Branson, with Jeff Bezos, um, and today another billionaire has gone to space. But yes, this is an important step because this is the first time a civilian crew has orbited around Earth. All civilian crew still need to be a billionaire there. Um, not my plan. I'll, I'll give you some insights into my plan in a bit. <laughs> So when we're thinking about setting up camp, whether it's down in the Titsikama forest or on the surface of the moon, Mars or beyond, or if we are thinking about any human community anywhere, think informal settlements, overcrowded central business districts, um, there are a few categories of things that are non-dispensable. So the first one's power. A reliable power system is necessary for a human to participate meaningfully in the current technological era. No more comments on that. Um, but solar power um, is a, a natural way to create power wherever you are in the solar system, because if you're in the solar system, you've got the sun. So you can lay out as many panels as you need to provide as much energy as you anticipate needing. And this kind of setup can be deployed remotely by rovers, in fact. Um, and this kind of setup should be increasingly how we are covering all spaces that face the sun and are not being used otherwise. Water, as I've said, uh, quite a heavy resource um, in terms of our consumption of it, you know, several liters per day, but also literally a kilogram per liter. So when you are thinking about going into an extreme place, bringing all the water that you need is actually not possible if you're going to be there for any longer length of time. So you need to be able to extract water locally. Maybe you're lucky to have a clean river nearby. Maybe uh, you're in Antarctica and you're going to need energy to melt that ice and turn it into water. Um, on Mars, there is ice in the sand. So Mars is cold, negative 60 degrees or so. Um, but luckily, there were once oceans on Mars, which means it was a lot warmer. Uh, so we know by the canyons that we see, the pebbles that we see, the coastlines that we see, looking at the surface of Mars. Uh, these are features that geologists tell us can only have been created by the movement of large bodies of liquid water. Um, so luckily, there's still some of this left in the sand. So think a rover with a bulldozer attachment, scooping up huge amounts of sand, heating it, collecting the evaporated liquid, processing it, putting it in tanks for storage, and then, of course, wastewater management to keep as much of this water in the system as possible. Um, food. So this kind of setup is, of course, not limited to space, uh, but we have seen different types of, I think, bok choy was grown in the space station recently. Tomatoes and, and other plants have been grown in the space station. So luckily, plants don't seem to mind the lack of gravity. On Mars, there is, of course, gravity, but it's less than Earth. So there should be no problem with setups like this. But of course, this is not only a trajectory for thinking about living off-world. This is the way we need to start thinking about food in terms of feeding a growing population of increasingly urbanized humans. Particularly in Africa, we have the highest rates of urbanization on the planet. If more people are moving into cities, that means more mouths to feed there, less people doing agriculture. So all in all, we're heading for a massive crisis if we're not there already. Um, this can mitigate the problem to some extent because by growing food in a setup like this, you can use 96% less water than traditional agriculture because you are getting drip through and feeding it back into the system so you don't lose much water. As we become more water scarce, particularly in Southern Africa, got to go more water efficient routes to produce food. Um, another benefit is that you don't need pesticides because it's a controlled environment. You you can change the temperature, the humidity, the light, the light intensity, the light frequency, the light duration, the nutrient ratios to cater for each specific strawberry or pea or whatever you may be growing. So basically, you can produce high nutrition of nutritional content food with as little resources as possible. Also, transport is then removed from the equation because you set up something like this in the basement of Woolworths or whatever it may be. Um, so producing food like this, I think, is actually a responsibility of the, the big players in terms of food production um, and uh, certainly the future of food security, whether we're thinking about Earth or beyond. So um, here's another live poll, and we'll get on to the next essential requirement for human communities. We've talked about power, we've talked about water, we've talked about food. Um, so Mars is about 200 million kilometers away on average. Sometimes we come closer together and sometimes further apart as we go around the, the sun. Um, but how long do you think a message takes to travel from Earth to Mars? It's traveling at the speed of light, which is fast, but not infinitely fast. So there is a delay, in fact. Um, how much is that delay? So, uh, data, I think uh, 
particularly during the pandemic, we have realized that being connected doesn't mean we need to meet in person all the time, but that having a, a way to connect through a communications network has been really pivotal to us uh, being as functional as possible um, during a time like the pandemic. Um, but in fact, in all scenarios, we are increasingly extremely reliant on our global communications network, the internet, um, and this is one of the, the technologies we can be really proud of, I think, as humans, is, is having built this global communications capability. Um, so in some sense, there is internet on Mars already, because you can see all the footage coming from the Perseverance rover, from the Tianwen-1, from the Curiosity rover. They have Twitter accounts. I guess humans are writing the tweets, but the footage definitely comes from the surface of Mars. So there's a connection already. Um, but how long does that data take to travel? Um, in fact, that's around 10 minutes on average. So having a video call with someone on Mars would be tricky, uh, but as we are used to on, on WhatsApp, kind of clips exchanged between the two um, would be sufficient for some kind of dialogue. But of course, software updates, 3D printing blueprints, um, being able to, to share updates with friends, family, and colleagues back on Earth will be critical. And satellites will enable that. Satellites in orbit around Mars, satellites in orbit around the Sun, satellites in orbit around Earth who will be able to relay signals between each other to ensure that wherever in the solar system humans are, they are still in touch. So shelter, um, we're not going to be building a wooden cabin <laughs> like you've seen in the video. Uh, wood and metal uh, are not good materials to transport from Earth to Mars, um, way too heavy. But uh, thinking about using local resources to 3D print structures um, is something a lot of people are working on. So using sand as a base and creating some kind of resin. Um, but you will need some kind of shelter because you cannot breathe the air on Mars. It's 96% carbon dioxide. Um, Increasingly with air pollution, there are parts of Earth where we cannot breathe the air. I was in Delhi recently and a colleague there keeps her cat inside her apartment while she's at work, not because it'll run away, but because it will get sick when it breathes the air, which is not passing through the filter. This is just one example of a story. So, you know, having to live in an air-conditioned environment in order to protect oneself from the non-breathable air outside is a reality that's approaching us, even on this beautiful planet Earth. Um, nonetheless, on Mars, Inside the shelter, people will be able to walk around normally, dress normally. Outside, you would have a pressurized rover or a specialized suit to enable you to breathe oxygen while you're out and about. Luckily, the gravity is lower than Earth, so once you've put on your pack, you will essentially feel almost similar in weight to how you would be on Earth. Um, one benefit of having a closed system like this is that we can keep track of all the resources that people use. And I'm sure you can understand parallels now between what we're trying to do with the off-world project in terms of generating data and the, the, how that data is useful when we really put people on another planet inside a dome and ask how much resources do these people need. You know, I didn't ask how much air you breathe every day, but I'm sure everyone would answer not really sure for that one, including myself, because of course we've never been in an environment where we have to calculate how much oxygen we need to survive. Perhaps on an airplane or somewhere where people do these kinds of calculations. Um, but, you know, if we reflect on our failures in resource management, uh, accurate data on exactly how much resources we need is really part of solving that problem. And having a closed system like this, it's necessary but also a bonus to be able to really calculate what do people need and to be able to provide that. The oxygen that we would breathe comes from that, that life-giving molecule water, H2O, right? The oxygen can come from there. So how do we manage all these resources? And that's also a whole other topic for another day, but um, in my mind, blockchain is an ideal way to have a, a network-based ledger recording resource consumption, predicting from that ledger resource requirements and having it distributed, having it transparent, having it publicly available, um, I think is the first steps in the thinking towards what kind of economic system will we have on Mars? Because resources will really be at the heart, as they should be, of the notion of economics. To me, economics means resource management. Tagging money onto that is an additional extra. Um, managing resources is really at the heart of what any economic system should be. And perhaps we'll return to some of the practicalities of food, water, oxygen, data connections. These are the real essential resources for a functional human being, whatever planet they're on. I want to go to Mars because, to me, the allure of the unknown has always felt far more powerful than the comfort of the known. Thank you for your attention.
Proudly Human's Offworld Project is a series of habitation experiments in the most extreme environments on the planet to prepare for life on the moon, Mars and beyond and to improve standards of living on Earth. During each experiment of several months, a carefully selected team will arrive in an isolated location, build infrastructure from scratch, run projects and live as a community while participating in making a documentary series. Do you have the right stuff? We are looking for resilient people with diverse expertise, a passion for adventure and a story to tell. Apply now to join our off-world community. When we allow ourselves to dream, when we believe in our dreams, and more importantly, when we take active steps towards achieving those dreams, that it becomes possible to create a proudly human future, whatever planet we're on. Thank you very much. So that was a jump into the video that we released in February this year, a call for applicants for the Offworld project. So I've introduced the project a bit all over the place, but I think now it's maybe starting to solidify in your mind. We will be taking applications and selecting specially uh, curated groups of people for each environment. Um, that was the call. We've had many applications and invited uh, members to our off-world community. And from there, we will select the teams firstly to go to the deserts and then the other subsequent experiments that I've explained. Um, maybe you're thinking of applying, maybe you're absolutely not thinking of applying. Um, if you're in the second category, then that's great because uh, an active, engaged audience, whether you are a critic or a supporter of the mission, is exactly what we're aiming for. We believe that this um, reflection on resource utilization, this demonstration that resource constraints can actually stimulate human and community spirit is kind of what we're trying to draw from here. You know, in this consumerist, materialistic society that we live in, I think we've forgotten to celebrate resource constraints. And this can often bring out the best in people, right? In challenging environments with severe constraints, we sometimes see the emergence of human spirit, the emergence of community spirit in a way that we perhaps didn't see when we had surplus. So this is what we want to showcase through this documentary. Um, if you can imagine, this kind of scenario, so um, we haven't publicly announced our location, but uh, with the in-person audiences and those online, I'm happy to share. Um, this is actually on Mars, right? And if anyone has visited this region in Namibia, you'll know there's striking parallels between the dunes, partly because of the lack of, of H2O the lack of humidity, the lack of surface water, and small grains of sand create these massive dunes. Um, so this was actually named by Dr. Yapi Fonsale on a dune on Mars, um, but we'll be going to a region of, Nam of Namibia that looks, looks similar. So 10 carefully selected experts will arrive with a, a few buckies of stuff. We'll set up camp and we will live as resource efficiently doing research, um, communicating, computing, doing all the high level functions that one would want from an off-world community, but living in quite a basic way in terms of the resource management. So what does that look like? As I said, water management will be central to it. We'll have solar power, atmospheric water generators. This is a company called Cirrus out of Cape Town. This is not quantum computing. This exists. You can buy these units. You just require power. They suck in the air and separate the water that's in that air um, and store it in a tank. So wastewater management. Swirl Techs, a Canadian company, is building us a wastewater management system that for 10 people's um, wastewater requires 300 watts for the day. I know light bulbs are now more efficient, but to me that still is like three light bulbs worth of power can process wastewater from 10 people to provide agricultural grade output water. Good enough for showering, good enough for washing dishes, good enough for uh, watering plants. So our potable drinkable water will come directly from the atmosphere, clean H2O. All other water will be managed. And I think this is something we need to really uh, embrace whatever part of the world we're on, because we've seen multiple regions across the planet um, facing water scarce, uh, scarcity issues. And on a planet 71% covered by water, this is truly embarrassing. Um, we need to up our game when it comes to water management. So this is one thing that we want to demonstrate. Um, our precision agriculture will be inside some kind of enclosure. So all the showering and dishwashing, etc., will happen in this enclosure. So anything that evaporates will again get sucked in by the atmospheric water generator. And as you can see, the cycle will continue. And we'll be monitoring everything, as I've said, heart rate, um, urine sample analysis, um, facial expression during meetings, all of these kind of things to try to understand the team dynamics, right? Which moments led to enhanced team spirit? Which moments led to breakdowns in the team communications? And how can we mitigate these going forward? 
So our satellite connection with all of the different devices will enable us to monitor that. Also our water management, obviously. So um, I'm going to start to wrap up now, and I think to reflect where we are. We are lucky to be living on a unique planet in the solar system. As far as we can tell, there are no other planets like it. And to refer back to what Ricardo had said earlier, um, Earth is really the one planet we didn't want to mess up because it's the only one that is teeming with life. There may be life hidden on other planets. Earth is the only planet teeming with life. That's partly due to our proximity to the sun, just the right distance to maintain liquid water on the surface, obviously a crucial part of our biosphere. Half of, you know, one hemisphere is basically entirely covered, 71% of the whole planet covered by this critical molecule for life. We should be absolutely grateful that we don't have to go to great lengths to, to source liquid water, um, but managing it is something we need to learn to do better. We can see life from space, that's the point. This is the only planet we know of that we can see life from space. Those are, of course, the, the trees and the photosynthetic belts. Um, a large part of that also comes from the algae in the ocean, but these regulate our temperature, regulate our rainfall, regulate our atmosphere. Um, it's really one big living system that we are a part of here, and we should be grateful that food grows by itself. Um, and we may think that as humans, we, we are the data creators, we've got databases, smartphones, we're quite fancy, you know. But in fact, nature came up with a, a data system way before we emerged, Homo sapiens, because um, all life on Earth contains this molecule, DNA, from bacteria all the way through to humans. We all contain very similar molecules in terms of the, the sequence um, of the actual structure of the DNA itself. We can tell we're all one living system. We all emerged on this planet together, and we all are interreliant while we live together on this, on this planet. Um, but in terms of trying to understand what life is, this unity is not very useful from a scientific perspective because we'd love to know, are there other examples of living systems? Does all life have to have DNA? Um, and those are some questions we can only answer from exploring beyond. Um, so we, we do have a discussion period coming up now, so if there's anything I haven't touched on, um, we'll, we'll be open for Q&A and discussion of the polls, etc. in a moment. Um, but this is, a, as the Ricardo referred to, my high school science project when I was 13. And as my mom pointed out, I haven't, I've been saying exactly the same thing for most of my life because if you can read there, it says power, air, water, food, city life. And these are the categories that we need to focus on. As I said, whether we are thinking about informal settlements, overcrowded city centers, bases on the moon or bases on Mars, there are significant overlaps between what we need to do to get that right. Um, and these are the categories. So... That's uh, me almost wrapping up. Um, and here's another live poll. I wonder if I've converted anyone to or from the 7% who are already planning to go. Um, but please feel free to enter your answer to this one. Would you ever relocate to Mars? Let's say financial considerations aside, which they certainly are in my mind. <laughs> So, uh, reflecting on your answer to that poll question, I'd like to remind you that um, a trip to space is something you're already on. We're in space. The sunlight that is streaming down through this beautiful location comes from the sun. The sun is a body in space. Earth is a planet going around the sun. So, in case you didn't plan to go to space, this is a reminder that you're already there. Um, secondly, I think, and this is a beautiful quote, we need to really take this period during this lockdown or whatever, this is like a gift to reflect on what is, our, what is our contribution to our community. Because as I've said, things on Earth don't look to be getting less extreme in the future. So this is already an extreme environment. We're already here. We're already living in a community. So whether you're going to put in an application to come to Namibia or under the ocean or Antarctica, or whether you're reflecting on, on your critical role in the community that you are a part of here on Earth, I think uh, thinking about the fact that we are crew and that we have a contribution to make is a, a great thing to reflect on as a thought experiment or perhaps as a real project proposal. Feel, please feel free to send, send yours in. Um, so I don't, I don't know what uh, each of your mission plan is for, for Project Crew Earth. Um, I haven't had a chance yet to speak with each of you. But what I do know for certain is that each one of us has an important role to play. We are all here for a reason. We are here during this critical time for humanity and the planet for a reason, and that's a great opportunity to embrace what it is to be human, which I think is curiosity, 
compassion and a spirit for adventure. So I look forward to further discussion with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana. As always, fascinating. I think rather intimidating when you start realizing how destructive we are as humans on this planet. Um, and I think what, what was sort of top of mind at the message you left there is about how do we change behaviors around this resource management? Um, and before, before we go into the Q&A and, and look at our polls, I would just be intrigued in, in your opinion, Adriana, what will it take to change behavior in, in the world, in, in planet Earth, for us to look at resources differently? Maybe a global catastrophe? I think we're right on schedule for that. Um, yeah. You know, we've got choices. We can either wait for, for nature to point out to us quite obviously that we are stretching beyond the capacity of the earth in terms of our requirements, or we can start to mitigate those uh, challenges before they emerge. And I think that's exactly where we are right now as a society. Um, you know, certain measures like carbon tax and all of that, I don't feel will really make enough difference, um, but we should do those anyway. Um, sure. We should each personally try to contribute to that philosophy, I think. But uh, yeah. all in all, the extremity that we're now facing is, is the earth crying out and saying uh, your industry is having an impact on the biosphere. Um, yeah. So I think interesting times ahead. I'm, I'm someone who loves a challenge, so don't let my, my wording here put you off. I'm, I'm quite excited about the challenges that lie ahead because it's a chance for advancement, a chance yeah. to change the way that we think, a chance to adopt new measures of, of reflecting on ourselves as a society. So an exciting time, you know, we're, we're here now, we're Absolutely. in space on planet Earth. So yeah, I think let's remain yeah. curious and let's remain compassionate. Right, absolutely. And I think it's let alone that big sort of uh, hammer that's going to hit us if there's a, a catastrophe, but I think it's about spreading the word and having a conversation about it. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Let's have a look at some of our polls. I don't know if those polls are live yet, or if you've got a Q&A, &A, uh, we can go into it and we can see what questions we have to discuss further. So, Adriana, you took a 10-day silent retreat a, a few years back. Um, what did you learn from that experience? Um, I'm intrigued about, and I suppose it, it links back to the isolation, but share with us what was your experience on, on that retreat? Yeah, it's a challenging one. This is the Vipassana 10-day, if, if anyone's tried it or heard about it. So you basically spend, the silent part was easy. I mean, I don't, I don't need to engage in constant dialogue. Um, but the sitting and meditating for more than 12 hours a day was very challenging. So you basically only break for meals, otherwise you sit and meditate for 12 hours a day. So I think, I think this is an opportunity to really reflect on yourself, with yourself, and only yourself. So if anyone's thinking of doing it, I think it, it brings up things from the past that you may not have dealt with. Sure. It reminds you of your reactions to things um, that may appear to be unconscious that you can then witness because you're sitting down with yourself for so long. Um, so it's a great kind of, kind of therapy in a way um, to yeah, reflect on most of your life. I mean, that's a lot of hours, right? So all sorts of things pop, pop into your head. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but great training, I think, for yeah, perhaps preparing for missions where you won't constantly be engaging in the, the social nature of Earth. Um, if there's a community with only 10 people living on another planet, so That's I think right. a lot of the time probably would be spent uh, in silence, getting on with business. Um, not business, business, tasks. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, I would, I would recommend it. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, get, to, get to know who you are and, yes. and be happy with yourself. Yeah. We've got a question from George, Giorgio. Uh, Adriana, kindly share with us your three-point plan on how future Mars human exploration will really improve the life of the South African community at large, and not only a few in the space industry involved. Great mm, question. Three-point plan. Thanks, George. Um, yeah, so I think for me, the, the parallels, and I think I've, I've explained that here with the parallels between the endeavor to set up camp beyond Earth and with the current challenge of uh, creating acceptable living standards for 8 billion humans have a lot in common. And on Earth, we've got a lot of legacy systems, leaky piping, um, you know, old, old school power production methodologies. So in my mind, it's actually a cleaner, easier scenario to think about building a community on Mars than it is to think about all of the challenges here on Earth with respect to what already exists. Um, but I think 
the parallels are so striking that I think it's a, a great endeavor to do both. So on a practical level, I think uh, let's look at the systems that have been developed for the space station. LED lighting to grow food is one of them. Wastewater management systems to process water because transporting water up there is expensive. The communication systems, many other examples in terms of the power, water and agriculture, ag agricultural endeavors that I've talked about here mm -hmm. um, were you know, developed a lot with respect to the people in the space station and how we could support them. So already I think you can see the precision farming, which has to be happening in Joburg CBD, every city CBD, yeah. in order to produce food locally for people living there, all the way through to water, water filtration systems. Um, these are some practical examples of things that we need to scale out into so-called informal settlements to make them formal. These people need reliable power, water, food, and communication systems, and safe shelter. I mean, it's not that complicated. Mm. Um, and these are exactly the kind of low-cost 3D print from sand, you know, extract your water from the atmosphere. This is exactly the kind of spirit that we need to be doing things with here, here in South Africa. That's on the one level, a practical level. Okay. On another level, I think the aspiration and the inspiration are absolutely critical. You know, how do we get an increasing number of young people, especially on the African continent, to get excited about STEM? You know, STEM as itself doesn't even sound that exciting. I'd rather phrase it as exploring and learning. And space exploration is a fantastic way to get excited about both exploring and learning because it's a way to, to understand our, our uh, humility and our you know, small scale, let's say, in the universe that we find ourselves in. Sometimes we get bogged down by all the problems of our personal life. But when we look up at the night sky, we realize that we're quite insignificant in the larger scheme of things. Um, and this is a wondrous thing to appreciate. Um, that we, are, we have the opportunity to find ourselves in this beautiful reality that's bigger than the mind can even comprehend. Um, and the idea, I think, of, of curiosity-driven exploration without fail gets young kids excited. And I know this because I give a lot of talks at schools. And trust me, giving a talk to a bunch of four-year-olds is a lot more challenging than a lovely <laughs> audience like you today because you know when you're boring, right? The kids get up and leave or whatever. <laughs> so without fail, Curiosity-driven exploration excites young people. Um, I think and if that's the approach we, we take to engineering new wastewater management, you know, no one wants to be told you can grow up to be the manager of a sewage plant. Mm. That's what came out in my aptitude test in high school, by the way. <laughs> manager of a sewage plant. This is a really important job, right? But if we talk about building um, wastewater management systems for Mars, this is exciting. Um, if we talk about how can we grow food with the least possible water, this has uh, applications for the Cape Flats, but also for the moon. Yeah. You know, so these parallels for inspiration, for getting excited about learning, getting excited about learning new things, getting out of your comfort zone. Um, I haven't given a third, but for, for me, those are the most important, the practical technology side, but the, the inspirational, curiosity-driven, passion-driven side of uh, really what it is to be human. That's wonderful, yeah. John, are you finding a link to that question through your involvement with the government's uh, interministerial inter uh, program on the fourth industrial revolution? Are you finding a platform to talk about and share this, this thought leadership in our country? I know this will go out on YouTube afterwards. <laughs> Let me be diplomatic. Um, no, uh, yeah, okay. I'm not good at diplomacy. Yeah. I, I think that's the question. Is it, I mean, it, There's so much happening, what you've described now, to the question. And it's just how do you bring it back and how does it get deployed? I mean, we were part of the Department of Higher Education and Training Fourth Industrial Revolution panel. And I think for me, the most, one of the most important points to, to come out of that discussion, this was in 2019, by the way, yeah was that we need to put education online. We've got 20 million really? South Africans, so the, every, the matrix who, who leave school every year, plus all the adults who want reskilling constantly. So there's about 20 million people who would require some kind of training on a constant basis. We only have less than a million places in, in higher education institutions, so exactly. disaster alert. Um, so the recommendation was to go online and then 2020 came. So, you know, blessings and, and challenges often come together, but um, I think going online for education uh, is an absolute must if we're gonna have this many minds that need stimulation, they need accreditation, they need uh, interaction sure. with the uh, mentors. Um, sure. So going online has helped, I think, in an education, you know, but now we need to make sure that the power and the water and the internet connection are also there for all the schools. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise well, we almost it's almost had day possible. zero in Cape Town. So that would have been another big bang or hard, hard lesson if that ever happened. Yeah, so I think your point's quite valid. It's we've had all the indications of what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Now we just need to get on with it. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Thank you. Um, Andre uh, Paul Lombard has asked a question. 
Uh, not sure what the air movement is like on Mars. Will it be feasible to have air generators? Also, what would her Voskite solar cells reaction be like in some of these extreme circumstances? So the first one's interesting with respect to this helicopter. So a few years ago, when I was sharing information, it was thought that wind turbines or any kind of propeller-based system wouldn't really work because the atmosphere on Mars is 100 times less okay. than the atmosphere at sea level. So 1%, that's a lot different, right? But now that this little 1.8 kilogram drone has managed to lift itself using a, a drone sort of propeller, mm. um, it could be possible to produce energy through some kind of a system. There is, there is wind movement on Mars, so this is the only like weather Mars has okay. is wind, which kicks up sand because it's very fine grained. So you do get periods where your solar panels are, for example, covered, right. or the sun is shielded with these dust clouds that emerge, which can last for some time. Um, so having another way to generate power is crucial. It could be nuclear. Maybe that's a, a question that has a lot of ethical discussion, so let's move that to the side for now. Wind, wind power could be one way, but biofuel. Biofuel will be a critical okay. addition to the power system, probably right. more important than wind, I would say, for now, off the cuff. Um, but basically, any organic waste can be turned into some kind of biofuel. Hydrogen, of course, being the simplest atom and also a source of fuel is also extractable in some way. Mm. Um, so onto those solar, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that exact technology, but luckily we've had a lot of testing of, of solar technology in space. Okay. Um, the Voyager missions, which are still going decades later, um, plus the Curiosity rover and any space technology, none of it's burning fossil fuel, right? The stuff's too heavy, of course, to travel around. You can't have a combustion engine without oxygen. So the solar panels have been tested to a large extent from the space station all the way out. Um, so kind of an old school approach, Sure. Just throw as many solar panels at the problem as you need. And importantly, I think, find a way to, to produce these on Mars. So can we 3D print solar panels from sand? Wow. We should be thinking about this on Earth. I mean, think about refugee camps in the desert. Think about people living in areas that vegetation is getting less and less, like the Karoo. Why does it take a mission to the moon to have companies thinking about 3D printing solar panels from sand? But yes, there is, sure. a, there is a company that's very, doing very exciting work on just that for the moon. But as South Africans, I say, we have to put up our hand and say, can we scoop up a handful of dirt and figure out how to make a 3D, uh, 3D printed solar panel from that? That's the kind of thinking we need. Fascinating. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Andre, for that technical question. We're going to end off on, on a, a last question before we close, um, Adriana. Vishali Ladd asks, how would the relocation to Mars work? Should everyone be able to move? I think. That's, a, that's a lovely question. Um, I could answer that in a, a number of ways. I mean, I think Earth's always going to be an e the easiest place in the solar system to live, just because of the abundance of natural resources. Um, and most of those are tied into the biosphere, right? So the presence of life on Earth is what co contributes to it being livable for us. Mm. So the mass species extinction event that we're currently causing, not good. Uh, almost 50% of all animals and plants are scheduled to go extinct in the next 10 to 20 years. Sure. Shocking, right? Why is this not on the headlines <laughs> every day? Um, but yeah, we are killing off the biosphere that supports us here, so how that will pan out is unknown. Mm -hmm. But I would say, you know, Earth is in the Goldilocks zone in terms of its distance from the sun. So it's going to be a special kind of person who wants to go out of their comfort zone. And yes, I've raised my hand for that for uh, most of my life now um, because I enjoy a challenging environment. So I think it, it helps me think more clearly, you know, some people are like that. Um, so for most people, probably they're going to be staying on Earth. Um, but for those who would, who would like to leave, I don't believe it depends on how much money you have because you would notice that the, the billionaires who've launched themselves into space are typically back the same day for all of the meetings or whatever they have to do. <laughs> so for me, that's never been my objective. Um, if I were offered a trip to space, I would probably give it to some younger person um, because that's not my goal, right? A few minutes of lack of gravity, that's not what I'm, what I'm aiming for here. I want the adventure of arriving and living in a new place. Um, to mm. open people's minds about what's possible, to develop new ideas in this uh, extreme environment, and to let those ideas then filter back. Um, and I believe anyone who has this passion will be able to get themselves to Mars. Um, 
let me say, watch this space. You know, if I manage to go, I've never been a fan of money, so I don't have much. Um, spend it as fast as it comes. Um, so if I get to Mars, it will not be at my own cost, and I believe that would be the same for any dedicated expert who has something to contribute. And that doesn't mean you have to be an engineer or a scientist. We need mediators. We need food production. Um, you know, food is such a central part of the, the feeling in the group in Antarctica. So Correct. having a nice menu, you know, even with limited resources is really a critical factor. Mediation being another one. I think those are two really critical ones. Artists, I mean, why not build big sand sculptures on the surface of Mars that can be seen from Earth? Um, I don't know, the options are endless in terms of how you would contribute to that community. Um, but I believe if anyone feels strongly enough that they have a contribution to make, and uh, absolutely uh, steadfastly believing they're going to love life on the yeah. surface of Mars, then I believe there's nothing stopping you. So watch the space. Yeah. It's fascinating. So there is opportunity for other people other than billionaires, but it's actually people who actually want to work and live in a community on Mars. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah I wonder how many hours per day of manual labor billionaires would put in. So, it's not um, going to be a billionaire club. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how much the overlap is. <laughs> Adriana, it's been fascinating having your company. You're truly inspirational. And I think what really stands out and resonates for me is the fact that you are living this life with purpose, eh? with true, true purpose and meaning. Um, and I think what, what, what you've done is you, and you continue to do, is you're making it exciting to think that actually we could live in another environment. We could live in extreme environments, we could live off planet uh, and making that concept exciting. So thank you for sharing your story. Uh, we wish you well in your explorations, uh, but thank you for being so inspirational and inspiring us. And I think also, what, if I read um, on, your, on your research and I look at what you've shared with us today, I can understand why you are so, you've motivated so many scientists, young scientists, to actually keep innovating to make life better here on planet Earth. So well done and keep doing the good work you are. Thank you, Dr. Adriana Maria. Thank you. Thanks, Ricardo. Let, let me say it's been a real pleasure to talk to you after doing so much reading and research on the topic. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. I see we've got some results on our poll, Adriana. Um, how much research did you do prior to attending? Again, we didn't shift that needle. Well, that was 55, um, so it looks like a bulk did really nothing, so they came to listen to you, Adriana, which is fantastic. <laughs> for, thank you for sharing uh, those results. How much water do you use per day? What's the right answer? Sure, so quite a few people are using less than 50. Yeah, for me, I always wonder exactly how much a load of washing takes, but I suppose we can, one can Google that. Mm. Um, but that's very impressive. Um, to, yeah, no, yeah, it's difficult to keep tabs That's, on it. Is that sustainable, less than 50, um, in terms of if you look at extreme environments? If you want to come to Namibia, you need to be prepared to live with less than 50, so good, we've got okay, 25 good. people ready Excellent, to so go. we're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> in Antarctica, of course, there's plenty of it, as long as you can melt it, so it depends where you are. <laughs> right. And then, quite telling, how long does a message take to travel from Earth to Mars? Uh, looks like, uh, you said 10 minutes was the right sort of answer? Yeah. Yeah, so those who guessed one hour will be happily surprised that it's less than that. Um, so that does mean around 20 minutes for a return message. So like remote surgery is not something you want to do <laughs> on Mars. We couldn't play on Mars. <laughs> uh, but software updates takes 10 minutes. But it's minutes. fascinating that it takes seven to eight months to travel to Mars. Yes. But yet the message mean, can take 10 minutes. I didn't minutes. Message, mention that, yes. So around yeah, seven months currently to get there. Wow. And then lastly, that seven month period, would you ever relocate to Mars? Looks like we've lost a couple of uh, participants. We're down to one. I'm already planning for it. <laughs> Thank you, Adriana, for, for keeping our humans on planet Earth. <laughs> Maybe those other six uh, went uh, participating. <laughs> but we've got more on the elder side when it happens, maybe. Uh, it seems like it. That has definitely picked up. The side when it happens, pushing that decision down the line. Maybe people are keen to watch the documentary first so they can see what yeah. it's like. <laughs> And I think yeah, to, you join, to you, our audience joining us today, thank you for participating. And uh, if you happen to be in that uh, I'll decide when it happens category, I think I'd encourage you to apply to Proudly Human's uh, program and put your hand up. It sounds like a fascinating way to spend 40 days as a holiday in a desert with you arrive with what you've got on your back. And it's really fun. So if that's up your, if that's, uh, if that floats your boat, please do that. Um, it sounds amazing. But for those of you that you're not brave enough, what I'd encourage you to do at the very least, take some inspiration from what uh, Dr. Adriana Maria has shared with us, how we as humans can make a difference here on planet Earth in terms of how we, 
um, manage our resources and how we live in whatever small way it may be, in our communities and in our in home environments, just to change the way we live. So hopefully that message will uh, sit with you and at least uh, find a better way to manage the resources on planet Earth. Thank you for joining us. Stay well, stay safe, till we connect again. Goodbye.